Good morning, good morning. And what a wonderful time of year. Much like Christmas, this is a very good time of year for Christians because it is one of only a few times a year when so much of the world is focused on Jesus. Now, how much they truly have placed their faith in Him or not, it's up to them. But for us, it's refreshing to see at least so many uh, at least acknowledge Him publicly in some form and to want to be gathered uh, during what we call as this Easter season. Uh, and for our sermon here this morning, in two weeks, our word of the week will actually be resurrection. And so I wanted to not mess with our devotional calendar too drastically and pull a switcheroo. So we're not going to be doing a deep dive in the resurrection during the sermon hour, but we very much are going to be talking about the resurrection um, from the aspect of we're going to be looking at one of the most significant and important results of the resurrection. And see, today we're going to consider our word from the week, which is holiness. In Hebrews 12, verse 14, the Hebrews author writes, We are to strive for peace with everyone and for holiness. Without which, no one will see the Lord. And now you'll notice a couple of the the pictures that I have on these slides were screen captures from a a video series called The Bible Project. It's a a pretty famous YouTube channel. Um, I will say a lot of their videos are are pretty good. I I can't speak to every single one of them, but they, they do a pretty good job of providing these, uh, these graphic illustrations for biblical concepts. There's been a few that I've watched that I feel like they weren't quite specific enough with what the scripture has to say, so I can't give it a wholesale recommendation and say, yes, everything they say is gospel truth, but, but most of their videos are pretty good. And, and so I took a few screen grabs from their video on holiness because I think the way that they have depicted it is a pretty good representation of how we can come to understand holiness. And one of those aspects of holiness that they focus on in their video is an aspect of holiness that I think that we can overlook today. And when we consider holiness, we need to consider the way that holiness is a word that's used to describe the moral perfection of God. His very character and nature is so radiantly pure and good and righteous that any non-holy things will be cast from his presence. And so in this screen grab here, we have holiness emitting as a light. And it is casting out the shadows from his presence. And we see this when we consider how Satan and the other angels, when they succumbed to the sin of pride, they were cast out of heaven. But the angels that remain faithful to God, what do Scripture refer to them as today? Holy angels. The angels that did not sin, that did not follow Satan, they maintained their status as being holy and in God's presence. We see this similar concept when we think back to Genesis with Adam and Eve in the garden. And after Adam and Eve knew sin... By eating from the forbidden tree, they were cast out of the garden to no longer be in that level of communion and fellowship with God. Holiness is integral. It's necessary for fellowship with God. If we are not holy, we will not see the Lord. We can think of holiness for our souls as blood to our bodies. You know, we, we can survive, contrary to what we like to admit. <laughs> our bodies can survive for weeks without eating a single bite of food. <laughs> I can't imagine going more than about a day without food. But we can live for weeks without food. We can 
survive days even without water. Now, not a whole lot of days, but we can survive a few days without so much as a drop of water. We can survive several minutes without air. There's numbers, numbers of cases of, of drowning incidents where people were rescued from the waters. They had been underwater for some 15, 20 minutes. And the rescuers, when they pull them up out and, and through CPR, and they're able to revive this person who has been without air for several minutes. But if we go for literally seconds without blood, our bodies die. In terms of uh, bodily anal body anal uh, anatomy, there's the carotid artery, which is in the neck. And if you place someone in a chokehold and you cut off the carotid artery, you can kill them in seconds because the brain cannot survive without blood. If we have the femoral artery and our legs severed, the blood loss from having that artery cut will render us lifeless in a matter of seconds. You see, a, a soul without holiness is as dead as a body without blood. We desperately need holiness. And as we look throughout Scripture, the way that this term of holiness is used, we see that it's used in, in a lot of different ways. Some of the ways that the, the Bible Project uh, journeyed through in their video was considering holiness as our source of life, as being uniqueness and as, as being God's power. And while this is true, uh, holiness is, is used over 1,100 times in Scripture, actually close to 1,200, over 900 times in the Old Testament and 300 times in the New Testament. If you remember last week when we talked about righteousness, and we said that, that righteousness is one of the most common words in all of Scripture, holiness is right there with it. Almost one for one number of occurrences. You cannot read throughout Scripture without encountering holiness on nearly every page. And when we look at all of the ways that this term holiness is used throughout Scripture, there's, there's one kind of ever-present uh, definitional kind of root for that term. And so one of the ways that we can conceptualize holiness, uh, I, I heard this analogy given once of to think of the way that when we are, are preparing dinner and, and we're slicing vegetables, the word in Hebrew for holiness is kadash, which shares the same root with the word to cut or to separate. And so when you're slicing these vegetables, the holy aspect is not merely the cutting, but what do we do with those vegetable slices? We, we separate them. We set them aside for a purpose. We're going to use what we cut to make this, this dish, or this stew, this whatever we're making. We are, we are separating it from, from the root. We're separating it from the stock. And we're going to use it for a purpose. When we consider God as holy, holiness refers to Him being separate and apart from this world, this fallen world. His moral perfection and divine existence means He is, he is not of this world. He, he is removed from it. He is separate from it. But then when we see the way that holiness is used to describe the people of God, we see that holiness refers to the way that God has separated His people from the world. We are cut apart, cut above the rest, if you will, as we are set aside for His purposes to be morally pure and removed from the sins of the world. And what was really fascinating when I was doing my studies this week on holiness, I want to share with you just a few insights uh, about the first instance that we see holiness being used in, in Scripture. Uh, in the Old Testament, we get through all of creation and everything is good. But the very first instance that we see something being declared holy by God, it's on the seventh day. You see, all of creation, all of the stars in the sky, all of the seas and the deep, all of the life, even on the earth, is good. But it's the seventh day, the day of rest, that is declared as holy. You see, the seventh day was set apart as something distinct. 
to serve a special purpose. It was a sacred time to be marked on the calendar for peace, for calmness, for rest. And we understand that the reason for God doing this, having a holy day, was not for His benefit. He needed no rest. The Sabbath, the, the rest, so Sabbath means rest, the, the Sabbath was for man's sake. Because God knew that we would need a day for intentional admiration of God. To intentionally remove ourselves from the stresses and the toils and the labors of daily life. And to realign ourselves with God's purposes. Now, we don't respect the Sabbath in the Jewish sense today because Jesus has fulfilled that rest. In Hebrews chapter 3 and 4, we, we read of the way that we find our rest now in Jesus, in the present. But our rest also comes in the future sense upon His return. But that doesn't take away from the importance of us being intentional in finding holy time in our lives to dedicate to God. There's this everlasting principle of putting God first in all things. And so it's a challenge for us to consider what part of our day can we set aside intentionally to spend with Him in, in worship, in prayer, in reading from His Word, in doing His charitable, loving deeds. Service to God is very important. And then we don't see, again, holiness is used nearly a thousand times in the Old Testament. We don't see it again in all of Genesis. One of the longest books in the Bible. <laughs> the next time we see holiness isn't until Exodus with Moses before the burning bush. See, when God appears to him in the flames of the, the burning bush, God speaks to Moses and he says, Moses, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. See, only God can make something holy. Nothing other than God is inherently holy in and of itself. And when something is holy by God, it is to be treated with reverence. It is to be treated with purity. It is to be treated with respect. And after this encounter with holiness, we know that God led Moses and the Israelites out of Egyptian slavery and into the wilderness. And it is only after being freed from Egypt that we begin to see this word holy start appearing on almost every page from then on out in the Old Testament. Holiness being used to describe God Himself. I, the Lord, am holy. Holiness used to describe His people. And if you read through Leviticus, you'll see many times after God gives a, a social restriction or a dietary practice of abstaining from certain foods or certain cleanly ritualistic practices, they're followed with the command that for you are holy because I am holy. Many of the laws in the, that God gave the Israelites were for the, the distinct intentional purpose of making the Israelites distinct from the pagan cultures around them. Setting them apart to a higher standard of moral and ethical living. But holiness not only is used to describe the way that God separates His people and gives them a certain lifestyle, but then we see that even within God's people, the priests are considered holy from them. The priests are set apart as, as the holy people within the holy people. The priests are those that are the chosen ones that are set apart for the special role in society as being those sacrificial servants to God. It was only the priests that could offer up sacrifices on the people's behalf. These people, though all people were expected to live by God's laws, the priests were held to an even higher standard of cleanliness and ritual purity because they were the ones that would be approaching God in the temple, the high priest being chief of all. And this is something that we need to remember as Christians because it was Peter in 1 Peter 2.9 that writes that Christians, you 
are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Today, there is no such thing as a, a holy person within a holy people. There is no such thing as, well, well, that's priest so-and-so, and that's, that's father so-and-so. They are more reverent. They are closer to God than me. Now, Christians, if you are a Christian who is in Christ, you are a priest. You are a holy person. You are a saint, which entails a moral responsibility to live like one. And then as we get to the New Testament... What was shocking to me, the first time that we see holiness used to describe anything other than the Holy Spirit, holiness is uttered out of the mouth of a demon. In Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 26, we read that Jesus is in Capernaum. And on the Sabbath, he enters the synagogue and he was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, not as the scribes, and immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out. I think it's fascinating that the first time that Jesus is recognized as holy is by a demon. Jesus is recognized as not just holy, but the Holy One of God. This is something that is recognized by His enemies and needs to be recognized that much more by His followers. He is the Holy One, the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior, the Redeemer. The judge. He is holy. And now we could, we could look at literally hundreds of examples in the New Testament of, of uses of holiness. And as a fun activity, as you're reading through your Bibles, just make a little tick mark. Like a little, a little mark. Anytime you see the word holy or sanctified, it's, it's the same word in the, in the Greek and in the Hebrew. Holy or sanctified. And, and you'll be amazed by how often you encounter this. But we need to answer the question here this morning. If we cannot enter the holy city after judgment, if we cannot see the Lord unless we are holy, how do we become holy? Now the Hebrews author tells us. The same author that tells us to see the Lord you must be holy, he tells us exactly how we are made holy. In Hebrews 10 verse 10. We have been sanctified. There's that word holy. We have been made holy through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And then in verse 29 of the same chapter, but then if you back it up into Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14, we see that the sanctification through the body of Jesus comes because of the blood. How much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. That purifying of the conscience, that is that process that brings about holiness. It's a process that comes from his shed blood. There was only one way for mankind to be made holy, to be made pure, to be sanctified. You see, we all have sins in our life. We are all living separated from God and in need of forgiveness. We're all in need of being made clean. And the only way for that to happen was for God himself to die in our place. See, only God could endure the punishment for our sins. And he did this through his son, through Jesus on the cross. It was only the holiness of Jesus that was pure enough to take on the blackness of our sins and make them clean. The cross, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus is the reason for this holiday that's being respected worldwide today. 
for Jesus to die on the cross so that we could be made holy. Now, I know that this isn't a, a typical, quote-unquote, Easter sermon, and we still have a couple slides left to get through. Um, and we'll pick up on the resurrection in a couple weeks. But I want to offer this challenge that as we depart from here in a little bit, and we go back into the daily life and the hustle and the bustle, and we're surrounded by our various Easter traditions, uh, we should be challenged to challenge others to consider the meaning of the resurrection. The meaning of the cross. What did it cost God? What does it mean for us today? It means that we get to be holy. That we get to see the Lord. That we get to be made clean. We get to live eternally with our Creator. We get to never taste the sorrow of death because Christ, on Judgment Day... After that, death will no longer have its sting. There will be no tears, no heartaches, no more cancer, no more sickness, no more sin. For those of us that have been made holy by the blood of Jesus. And that is what awaits us. But the question is when are we made holy? This is the hat. How are we made holy? By the blood of Jesus on the cross. The question is when. 1 Corinthians 6.11 Paul teaches, And such were some of you, talking to the Corinthian sinners, sinners like you and I even, who have repented of those sins. And he's reminding them, you came out of a life of sin. When did you come out of that life of sin? You were washed, you were sanctified. There's that word again. You were made holy. You were justified. There's a word from last week. Righteousness. You were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. You see, the shed blood of Jesus is what makes holiness possible. It is the very act that brings about holiness, but it is applied to our lives individually by the Holy Spirit when we submit to the waters of baptism, which washes away our sins. You see, at the moment of a believer's baptism, we are made both righteous and holy. Since the waters, this was the method that was chosen by God for us to receive holiness. It's the waters which Christ himself received to fulfill all righteousness. Waters which we receive today to emulate his death, burial, and resurrection for His blood to apply to our lives and wash away our sins. And it is the Holy Spirit that does that work in us when we submit to God's standard. And now you're probably thinking when you read this, this verse, okay, so what's the difference between holiness and righteousness? Or sanctification and justification? Well, we can think of it this way. Both are necessary. We cannot be right without God, without both of them. Now the good news of the gospel is that we don't have to be perfect in and of ourselves to obtain righteousness or holiness. Because Jesus was perfect and his perfection is credited to us when we are obedient to him. We are declared both righteous and holy when we join in Christ's death. But when we think about the difference here... We have to think about it in terms of human laws. You see, righteousness refers to the legal component. Respect for a law, respect for a standard. And, and we know today that a, a man can never spend a single day in prison. He can never have to pay a single traffic violation ticket or a fine or be audited for his taxes and, and pay some penalty. He can do everything legally correct by man's law, and he can still be an absolutely crummy person. He can still be a jerk. He can still be a bully. He can still be quite the sourpuss, but be righteous by man's law. And but when it comes to God's law, however, we see that character and legal perfection are to go hand in hand 
to have an unholy character is to, in fact, violate God's law. They, they go hand in hand. Righteousness refers to the legal aspect. Holiness refers to the character of a man, to the character of a person, to that moral purity, that morally distinct and good character that sets us apart from the world. And because of our holy character, we can be cleansed from our sins just as much as following in God's righteousness. And see, there, there is no once saved, always saved. Uh, that's something Matt mentioned last week. I think that's an important concept. That just as righteousness we looked at last week, there was the one-time event, but then there's, there's this responsibility to live in light of righteousness. We see that with holiness as well. We see that holiness is not just that one-time thing, but holiness is a lifestyle that we are called to live in. And so I want to share with you just one passage from our devotional reading this past week that refers to this concept. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 14 through 16, I didn't have it in my notes, so I looked down here, got to cheat. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. You see, holiness is something that we are to live in. Holiness is that character, that code of conduct that we are to live by. And while we can consider many passages that describe holy character, I just want to stick with the one that we're in right now. And so if you are in your Bibles in chapter 1 of 1 Peter, if you broaden your list to, to look at verses 13 through 25, there are 13 codes of conduct, if you will, that are in this passage that tie to holiness in some way. When we consider that holiness has that meaning of being morally distinct and set apart from worldly standards, we can see the way that these principles call us to a holy life. So I'm going I'm to go through the list. You guys can annotate it and take notes however you want. But the first one I see in this passage is that we are holy by having a prepared mind in a world that lacks foresight. We know that Jesus is going to return, and His return is going to bring judgment. We are to have a mind that prepares for that judgment ahead of time, while the rest of the world, they eat and drink and they be merry today because they fail to plan for the future that is to come. We also see that holiness is tied to having a sober mind, while the rest of the world relishes in intoxicated emotionalism. We don't live by simply what quote-unquote feels right, we don't live for just simply chasing that next high. We live to have a sober and a controlled and a disciplined mind in order to serve the purposes of God. We live holiness by maintaining the hope in our lives. This separates us from the world because without God there is no hope. There is no resurrection. There is no good news according to the rest of the world, but according to God and according to His Word and living as His people, we know that there is a hope. We know that there is a resurrection. We know that there is a new life. That there is an eternal heaven that we get to be in one day. That is the hope that drives and should drive all that we do. But as part of that and as part of our holiness that sets us apart from the world, we see that holiness means obedience to an objective standard. Obedience to truth. In a world that Lot subjective self-expressionism in a world that today puts transgenders on a beer can that celebrates these lies that a man can be a woman and a woman can be a man, that celebrates these lies that... I remember the speech that Oprah Winfrey gave one time. You live your truth. Folks, your truth will only get you one thing, and that's hell. You live by God's truth where you suffer the eternal consequences of living by yours. We, as Christians, believe in a singular objective truth. And in that way, we have great support from the science, scientific community. I was amazed by finding an unexpected ally last week when Richard Dawkins, one of the world's most famous atheists of the 20th century, came out and said there are only two genders. 
Because he will not deny what science says. And what science says is also what God says. We live different than the world that lives by lies. We live by the truth. But when we live by the truth, this might mean something. It might mean it's going to cost us our fleshly desires and our fleshly passions. To live holy lives means to deny our personal passions in a world that worships this concept of quote-unquote self-love. Well, you put you first. No, 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 no. We put God first. And that is what makes us holy and set apart from the world. We also are holy as we call on God in prayer. In a world that doesn't know God, in a world that doesn't have prayer to call on a higher power for strength, for comfort and support, we are holy because we know that prayer is real and effectual and that God hears our prayers. And this makes us holy from the rest of the world. This holiness means living with conduct that is living as a fitting response to the blood of the cross. See, in a, in a world that rejects the power of the cross is a world that doesn't know forgiveness. You look at how much grudge keeping and backbiting and vengeance is sought in the world today. As holy people, we don't pursue those things because we know forgiveness. And we know it because of the blood of Christ. We are holy because we believe in the power and purpose of the resurrection. You see, the world teaches us that dust is all that you will ever become in this life. But we know what awaits us after death. And it's so much more than dust. It's an eternal home with our Lord and Savior. We live holy lives by the way that we love one another. In a world full of hate and division, we choose brotherhood and friendship and fellowship. We remember God's word lives forever. No matter how much we hear the word claim that it is just an ancient document that's no longer culturally relevant today. That, that's the wording from progressive churches. Churches that today accept this idea that you can live openly in your sin. That you don't have to repent. That you don't have to change. That you can come as you are. That you can stay as you are. That God loves you and all of your sins. That is not the truth of the gospel. They say that scripture is not culturally relevant today. But scripture wasn't culturally relevant 2,000 years ago either. Because it wasn't culturally relevant, that's why Jesus died on the cross. Because he was teaching a message that was countercultural, and it's just as countercultural today. And we are holy because we respect God's word as living forever in our lives. And then lastly, we are made holy when we remember the good news of salvation. You see, we know that in the rest of the world, it's doomed for destruction. It's doomed to being consumed by fire. But we are holy as we remember God's salvation. That there is a life better than this. We can look at the world around us and we can see all the pain and the sorrow and the heartache. We can see all of the sin and the strife and the struggles. And we can say, surely there's more to life than this. Yes, there is. And God has promised us as much. That there is a better life. In the here and now, he gives us the duty of bringing about that better life to the best of our ability by preaching the truth. But he has promised an eternity where there is none of that pain and sorrow. And we live as holy people when we remember the salvation that we have. These things are how we practice holiness. And this is not an exhaustive list. This is just pulling from one passage. But if we do these things, we can be living holy lives as God is holy. And when we do these things, the blood of Christ continually purifies us and cleanses us from our sins. When we do these things, the Holy Spirit keeps us distinct and separate from the world. We'll close with verse 16 from, from our passage. Be holy, for I am holy. Holiness is, is both a conditional state of being right with God, 
But holiness is also a lifestyle that we are to live. Holiness is something that occurs in a moment. We're declared holy by the blood of Christ in baptism. But holiness is maintained in our walk with the Spirit of God. Holiness is being set apart by God from the world of sin and death. Holiness is being set apart by God for the purpose of glory and goodness and sharing the gospel message. Is that holiness is, is not empty. Holiness is full of everlasting promise and everlasting purpose. And holiness is the result of Christ's resurrection. And so before we close, I want to remind us of, of our challenge. When we go into our daily lives, let's remind people of the purpose and the result of the resurrection. It is to make us holy so that we can have fellowship with God. And before we close, I want to also have us consider our own holiness. Have you been made holy by Jesus? Have you been cleansed of your sins in the waters of baptism? If not, why not? Are you living a holy life, a life distinct and set apart from the world around you, knowing that you have a higher and better purpose than you will find in the world, and that's to live for God? If not, how can we help you? How can we pray with you? Whatever your needs are, let us know. It's together we stand and sing.